but not least today of the conference. And I'm pleased to uh, introduce the first speaker, Lucas Jensen, who is now at uh, Dresden. And Lucas will tell us about uh, fractionalized fermionic quantum criticality. And so, Lucas, you have uh, an hour, including questions, so the usual 50 plus 10, and uh, I'll let you know if uh, things are going overboard. <laughs> That's great. Thanks Perfect. a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for the introduction and, and in particular also for organizing this workshop. Uh, thank you all for, um, um, yeah, for all organizers for, for, um, for organizing this great conference. Um, happy to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to speak here, although I'm very sorry I cannot be there in person, but what I see from the recordings, it seems like a very great meeting. I will talk about fractionalized fermion and quantum criticality as introduced. And what I mean with that is an unconventional type of quantum phase transition that involves critical fermions that arise from a fractionalization phenomenon. And this talk will be about a series of works done with uh, various collaborators. Um, among these, let me in particular point out Urban Seifert, who was a postdoc in Dresden and uh, moved to Santa Barbara, uh, and uh, Shujo Ray, who was my uh, uh, student or is still my student, well, but will move to, to Denmark uh, for a postdoc um, soon. And Sihong Liu, uh, who's a joint postdoc uh, within the uh, Würzburg Dresden um, research cluster um, on uh, complexity and topology in quantum matter, uh, together with uh, Pakia's group. And uh, this is uh, the outline of uh, this talk. I will start by uh, reviewing uh, the concept of uh, fractionalized versus uh, conventional quantum criticality. And then I'll introduce um, a, a class of, of microscopic models that feature such fractionalized quantum critical points. And um, I will introduce these as some generalizations of um, the spin one half Kitai Fanikov model. Um, and these generalizations can be understood as uh, uh, kind of spin orbital models, or you could also think of these as so-called Kugel-Komsky type of models. And I will then argue in a third step um, that these Kitaev like spin orbital mo models or Kitaev Kugel-Komsky models, um, when adding some other perturbations, such as, for example, Heisenberg perturbations, will host fermionic versions of a fractionalized quantum critical points. So fermionic fractionalized, fra fractionalized fermion quantum critical points. And then I'll conclude. So, uh, to start off, uh, what do I mean with a, a fractionalized quantum critical point? Well, you have heard a very nice introduction into quantum criticality by, by uh, Joseph's uh, lectures uh, and um, how quantum criticality is typically introduced is um, in a way that we think of this as, a, as kind of a zero temperature version of a classical critical point. And a, a very well studied example uh, um, that, that also um, uh, comes in this respect is, is um, uh, the, um, um, yeah, a transfer suite easing model that is realized, for example, to very good approximation by um, a magnetic insulator cobalt niobate in an external magnetic field. And this shows a transition between a ferromagnet and uh, a field induced paramagnet. And this transition is in the, um, in the um, uh, yeah, in a one plus one dimensional easing universality class and can be mapped to uh, kind of the two dimensional thermal universality class. The point of this talk is uh, that actually quantum criticality is much more than just a zero temperature version of its classical counterpart. And often in many cases, there is kind of new physics that can emerge um, that cannot be understood in just in terms of this usual quantum to classical map. Um, actually, before I move on, uh, let me emphasize that this is a long talk. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt uh, at any time. I'm not sure about um, how we'll do it technically, but but yeah, just interrupt and, 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 and we'll, we'll find a way. So it would be great if you have any questions. So, what is kind of an example where this quantum to classic uh, quantum to classical mapping uh, does not does not uh, work? Um, this becomes uh, very prominent in, in frustrated magnetic systems, and a deconfined quantum critical point uh, between the nail uh, antiferromagnet and the valence bond solid, the VBS, uh, is, is, a, is a well studied example for that. Um, the Landau paradigm that that works so 
so so amazingly well for classical phase transition uh, tells us that the transition is generically through uh, either some intermediate phase or otherwise is discontinuous. But because of some subtle interplay between order parameter fluctuations and topological defects, uh, it has been argued that in fact a direct continuous transition is possible without any fine tuning. So in that sense, it's some kind of unconventional quantum critical point between two fully conventional uh, phases. This transition is characterized by new fractionalized degrees of freedom, um, which are in some sense can be understood as some constituents of the original degrees of freedom. The system is maybe some kind of made of uh, microscopically. And these fractionalized degrees of freedom, they interact via an emergent gauge field. But besides this example, there are other examples. Uh, for example, uh, transitions that involve spin liquids. So um, this, this is an example uh, where either one or both uh, of the adjacent phases are uh, so full of full of the full adjacent phases are characterized by by fractionalized excitations not only the quantum critical point but but the whole phase um so for example such such quantum spin liquid or other kind of topologically ordered phases and in many cases uh, these fractionalized excitations that govern uh, or that that are present in in or are deconfined in uh, the spin liquid phase they uh, become soft at the transition or even maybe gapless throughout the whole quantum spin liquid phase. And that then immediately means that the quantum critical point uh, is not only governed by the order parameter fluctuations as in the uh, usual landau ginzburg wilson paradigm, but also by these fractionalized excitations. So these are kind of fractionalized quantum critical points, which have characteristics that are very similar to the deconfined quantum critical points between the conventionally ordered phase. And such type of physics can be discussed uh, either at so-called kind of confinement transitions, by which we mean transitions between spin liquids, where the fractionalized excitations are deconfined, and conventionally ordered phases uh, where they, they are confined. But also uh, that can occur at, at kind of liquid liquid transitions uh, between two deconfined phases, say two uh, quantum spin liquid phases, which have different symmetries and or different gauge groups. So let me uh, discuss now an, exa an, an example that has been uh, studied in the literature. Um, and, and this is a model of, of interacting hardcore bosons on a, on a Kagome lattice. So this is some kind of a Bose-Hubbard model, um, however, not with usual inter uh, uh, um, on-site interaction, but with some uh, kind of plaquette density interaction. So kind of this term, uh, which is kind of de density on, on, on this, this uh, hexagonal plaquette uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, interaction parameter uh, uh, V. So uh, if we tune this uh, uh, V uh, in, 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 in comparison with, with a hopping T, then we can actually uh, find an interesting phase diagram um, as a function of V over T. Uh, so this V actually um, uh, uh, tunes through a, uh, a quantum transition uh, between two different phases. And for small V, uh, then uh, we're in a kind of uh, um, ordered phase, um, uh, kind of a superfluid phase. While if we increase V beyond a certain threshold, we end up in some kind of featureless, seemingly featureless uh, quantum paramagnet. However, uh, this, this quantum paramagnet is topologically non-trivial, as can be seen by uh, the scaling of the entanglement entropy. In fact, this entanglement entropy uh, uh, violates the area law uh, with, with, with some constant uh, gamma uh, that is finite. And in fact, in the low temperature, kind of intermediate to low temperature limit, it approaches precisely the value that would be expected for Z2 uh, spin liquid. So uh, um, that means that uh, indeed uh, we here now have a transition at this, this critical V uh, between conventionally ordered phase and spin liquid phase. So if this is really a continuous transition, uh, then um, what would be its nature? And um, well, if we think of, uh, if we forget for a second that uh, the, or, uh, the, the, the disordered phase is, is, a, quant uh, is, is a, a topological ordered phase, but if we think of just in terms of the landau ginzburg wilson paradigm, 
then we would say, okay, it's it's a paramagnet uh, to superfluid transition. Then we would say there's a two component order parameter. And naively, we would expect this in the XY universality class. And in fact, indeed, if one attempts some kind of uh, a scaling uh, a scaling plot of, of this uh, superfluid density as a function of, of, of this reduced coupling, which kind of measures the distance to criticality, properly rescaled with uh, powers of L, with the exponent being one over nu, with an xy value for this nu correlation length exponent, then one attempts a, uh, attempts a scaling collapse, uh, reasonably really well scaling collapse precisely for this xy value. So that would be consistent uh, in some sense uh, with, uh, with this naive expectation of xy universality. However, if we now um, measure the decay of the order parameter, then uh, uh, we still get a power law. So this is still consistent with a continuous transition. So this is everything, everything's consistent with a continuous transition. So this is really a quantum critical point. However, the decay of this correlator is completely different from what, what would be expected uh, for, for order parameter um, uh, decay in a, for a usual XY transition. So if if uh, if this were the uh, if this were kind of the um, uh, usual x y, we would expect an anomalous dimension that would be extremely small, uh, like like uh, uh, zero point zero thirty eight something like that for x y transition. However, what is measured here is an anomalous dimension that is even larger than one, so more than an order of magnitude larger. So this is really inconsistent with the standard x y transition. And uh, the interpretation of that is that actually uh, this, uh, because of the fractionalized excitations, which are kind of constituents of the original particles, um, this, the, this, this superfluid, uh, superfluid uh, order parameter is basically a composite of the original, uh, sorry, of, of the fractionalized particles, which are the particles that really govern the transition. And, so this order parameter, this superfluid order parameter is basically composite of the fractionalized excitations. And if we adopt this assumption, then we can compare uh, the, the, the anomalous dimension of such composite uh, from XY field theory with uh, the measured anomalous dimension. And ta-da, uh, there is actually a fairly well agreement uh, with, with the field theory expectation. So this is really consistent with the idea that the order parameter is really composite and and the true degrees of freedom governing this transition and in the, in the long wavelength limit are really these fractionalized particles. And in order to denote that uh, this is kind of the same field theory, uh, but for fractionalized excitations, one, uh, one, one calls this uh, universality class XY star, with the star denoting that it's a fractionalized version of this XY universality class. It's the same field theory, but with the gauge redundancy, meaning that some states in the spectrum cannot occur uh, be because of gauge redundancy. And these fractionalized particles are, are, are uh, states that cannot occur directly in the spectrum, but only composites thereof can occur, are measurable because they're gauge, gauge, uh, um, uh, 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 gauge independent. Okay, so uh, this is really to emphasize that some of the states do not occur in the spectrum, and uh, that can actually be uh, uh, explicitly measured. And uh, that has been done um, uh, fairly well for, for, the, uh, for the easing uh, kind of uh, version of, of, of this transition. So here, I would like to now compare spectroscopy for uh, the easing uh, quantum critical point versus the easing star quantum critical point in order to emphasize um, the distinction between conventional quantum uh, universality class and the fractionalized versions thereof. And uh, we'll know that uh, the, the, the transverse field easing model uh, is, is, is uh, realizing uh, the, the, the easing, easing quantum critical point. So, so it's a very good uh, realization where this can be measured. And uh, a fractionalized version of that can actually be found in, in a transverse field toric code model. So the toric code model is a model that features a Z2 spin liquid um, at, uh, at low uh, external field, but then a transition to, towards some uh, paramagnet. Is there a question? Uh, I, just, I just moved your, uh, the panel so we can see the Hamiltonian. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so everything's fine, right? Yeah, no, okay. it's fine. We see the transverse field toric code. 
I see. Okay, very good. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So these are basically just two Hamiltonians, which both show uh, Z2 transitions, easing transitions. But uh, on the left hand side, it's a standard transition, standard easing transition. On the right hand side, it's an easing transition towards a topologically ordered phase, Z2 spin liquid phase. And uh, that can be measured uh, using uh, exact analyzation uh, and or quantum Monte Carlo uh, and, and, and has been measured. Uh, and, and here's kind of the spectrum uh, that, that, uh, that you measure uh, as a function of, of this external field uh, um, in, in exact diagonalization. And then of course you want to, ex uh, want to um, go to the thermodynamic limit uh, so um, you, you, uh, you, you do some finite size extrapolation. And if you appropriately rescale your uh, excitation energies with uh, uh, the, uh, N, the number of states, then you get finite numbers in the thermodynamic limit um, at the quantum critical point. And these finite numbers uh, are in fact uh, also universal numbers that characterize the universality class. That can be compared for the uh, easing transition, easing quantum critical point in comparison with the easing star quantum critical point. And what we see here is, of course, uh, there, there's some ground state uh, that its energy is just put to zero. And then there are some excitations above that ground state. And, and this is also rescaled in a way that the first excitation is actually uh, at precisely one. So this is rescaled by the first excitation energy. But then uh, this, the second excitation energy, that's, that's a universal number. And uh, this universal number now for this uh, uh, Z2 even uh, uh, state uh, is 3.69 uh, in these units. Doesn't really matter what the number is, but what you should see here is that precisely the same excitation energy for the Z2 even uh, 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 operator, uh, 3.69 occurs also in the easing star transition. So this is really a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, for, this, for this number. Uh, for this excitation energy, appropriately rescaled in the thermodynamic limit between easing and easing star. However, there are other states on the left-hand side, like this Z2 odd state, uh, that does not occur at all on the right-hand side. And this is because of the gauge, uh, the, uh, because these, on the right-hand side, uh, this, is, this is really a gauge, uh, a gauge dependent uh, operator. So it's not allowed that this operator occurs in the spectrum. And therefore, it does not occur, and it's not, it's not visible in the exact diagonalization spectrum. However, in, con in contrast, there are other further states uh, here at very low energy that occur on the right hand side, but do not occur on the left hand side. And these, in fact, can be understood as some kind of topological copies. They are characterized by, by uh, different uh, uh, winding numbers of, of Wilson loop operators uh, around the torus. And, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, and in that sense, uh, each of these states that do occur on the right-hand side, I kind of have these topological copies at, at some uh, similar energy close by. So uh, a fractionalized bosonic quantum critical point uh, or a general, uh, a general uh, a fractionalized quantum critical point is kind of a, uh, a frag kind of, um, uh, it features a spectrum that uh, has some somewhat similar states uh, at precisely the same energy. Uh, sorry, the same st some states pre at precisely the same energy, but other states are missing because of a gauge redundancy. But instead, they have topological copies. So this is everything is kind of well known uh, for for bosonic transitions. And the point of this talk really is: can we find a fermionic version of such fractionalized quantum critical points? So we do know, uh, of course, fermionic conventional fermionic quantum critical points, gross nouveau type of quantum critical points. And we would like to uh, ask the question, can we find a fractionalized version that of? And I will argue that uh, this uh, is possible in, in kind of a spin orbital generalization of the Kitaev honeycomb model. So before I go there, are there any questions so far? Uh, Lucas, uh, I have a quick question about the Ising star. Yes. The Hamiltonian is just the toric code plus this transverse field term. Yes. And these are regular spin a half operators. It's not a gauge theory. It's just a spin model with these plaquette terms. So the field theory for this is just uh, phi four Wilson Fisher field theory, but 
with the uh, extra assumption that only phi squared is uh, gauge invariant, is that? Um, that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Phi squared is gauge invariant. It's, uh, and the reason being that, I mean, the question is, what, what, what is your phi actually in, in the microscopic model? Mm -hmm. And uh, the point is that the phi on the left-hand side in the, in the usual easing model, the phi uh, kind of corresponds to your z sigma z. But on the right-hand side, the phi does not correspond to the sigma, but to a fraction thereof. And you can think of some kind of abricost of decomposition into, uh, in, into spin-ons, and the phi corresponds to a spin-on. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, the phi is not gauge invariant. And in that case, it's, it's a Z2 gauge theory. Um, so in your low, your low energy spectrum is actually the same. So the, your low energy spectrum is just the phi to the four fifth theory. So it's just your, your, your uh, phi to the four, I mean, gap at, at the quantum critical point, your gapless phi to the four field. But in this, if you just consider the low energy spectrum, you have for you have kind of uh, thrown away uh, fr thrown away the gap uh, the gap vortices the gap gauge field the z2 gauge field z2 gauge field is gapped so it doesn't you would naively think in some Landau Ginsburg Wilson picture you would naively think it doesn't affect the uh, the critical behavior but uh, that's not fully true because of the gauge uh, gauge redundancy right the gauge symmetry so does that answer you? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Uh, maybe if I can add the what's condensing from the uh, Tory code side uh, as you turn on this transverse field. So is it uh, the Vison excitations that are uh, going critical? Um, look, or uh, uh, that's a good question from the field theory side. Um, um, very good question. Um, I'm actually not sure. I. Um, that may be true, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, um, yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. the device on hold critical. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's definitely that. Uh, I mean, this is really a, uh, is is really a confinement transition, right? So it's a transition between uh, between uh, uh, the vison is definitely gapped at uh, in in the z two uh, z two spin liquid phase. Uh, and it's confined in the conventional paramagnetic phase in, in, in a high field phase. Um, I guess it goes critical. Um, it goes critical at the quantum critical point. Then, um, or maybe yeah. it's actually uh, sort of a E, the bosonic spin on, maybe that's going critical actually. Maybe the Vison is staying. Actually, yeah. yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, probably the Vison is staying gapped even at the critical point. So yeah, you have um, a Z two gauge structure. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure actually. Um, that that I'm not sure about. Yeah, yeah but uh, yeah, we can continue. I know it's a bit tangential to your talk. <laughs> well, Thanks. it's, it's <laughs> yeah, anything. Anyway, uh, the, the point really is that um, that that is kind of has been one of our motivations. Uh, that there has been lots of lots of uh, lots of knowledge uh, in this in this bosonic uh, fractionalized quantum critical points. And our point really here is to, fi to find a fermionic version of that. Okay. So uh, let me, um, where am I? Okay. So, uh, so yeah. So the, the point really is we want to uh, generalize um, the Kitaev model. And, 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 and because of that, let me review the Kitaev Honeycomb model, the spin one half model first. Because actually, this generalization works very uh, close and in close analogy to to uh, to, to the spin one half model. So, what's the Kitaev model? It's a model of, of spin one half degrees of freedom, um, uh, parameterized by these polymatrices sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And um, the interactions are such that all the bonds on the honeycomb lattice are divided into uh, three types of uh, three types of bonds: uh, red, green, and blue. And on the blue bonds, we just have an easing sigma x interaction, while on the uh, green bonds, we have a sigma y interaction, e sigma y interaction, and on the z bonds, we have a sigma z interaction. And you can show that classically, this actually leads to large degeneracy of states. Uh, so this is a highly frustrated model. Um, classically, these spins really don't really know where to point at. 
because basically uh, basically if you want to satisfy the red bonds you want to would would like to point your spins towards the z axis while if you want to satisfy the the, the uh, green or the blue bonds you want to uh, point your uh, spins into x or y direction however uh, still uh, and and that's a crucial point of kitaev you can solve this model exactly and that's 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 extremely nice uh, and that is done um, for instance by some majorana representation so uh, the idea is that to represent your poly matrices, uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, by um, products of Majorana operators. And uh, here you, uh, you, you use four Majorana operators called bx, by, and bz, and c. So these are really uh, um, operators that are Hermitian, uh, square to one, and anti-commute among themselves. And uh, you can show that actually this combination of, of, of products of Majorana operators satisfy the SU2 algebra, uh, consider, uh, assuming that a particular gauge constraint, is kind of C2 gauge constraint is satisfied. So with this gauge constraint, uh, this is really a faithful representation of, of your spin operator. And therefore it is allowed to replace your, your sigmas by these, uh, these Majorana operators and basically if you plug these into the Hamiltonian, then of course, because of you had bilinears in terms of sigmas, now you get quartic terms in, in, get of, in, 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 in terms of these Majorana operators. This does not yet look more simple. However, you can combine uh, two of these operators in a new variable called U. And this new variable, again, is a Hermitian operator. And you can show that it squares to one. That's uh, basically the reason, uh, the reason being that, that these B operators square to one. And is Hermitian. So it's an observable, if you like. You could think of, you would like to, or, I mean, you could naively think that is an observable. Actually, it turns out it's not, but the product of R is. And um, crucial point here is that you can show that these U operators commute among themselves and with your Hamiltonian. So all these uijs, which are products of, 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 of these bi, bj on the different bonds, where i and j are the site indices, so these kind of live on the links, all these u operators commute among themselves and with a Hamiltonian. And that means that we have an ex uh, extensive number of conserved quantities uh, that can be simultaneously diagonalized with a Hamiltonian and, uh, and and that immediately uh, uh, means that your 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 problem of of, of uh, 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 computing the spectrum of this Hamiltonian has become much simpler. And um, uh, so basically, that that's the way this this uh, exact solution works. If is that you go into sectors uh, where where these UIJs uh, are, are diagonalized together with the Hamiltonian, so you can just replace these by numbers. And since these are Hermitian operators that square to one, these numbers are just plus or minus ones because the eigenvalues are just plus or minus ones. And that immediately means that these U operators that uh, uh, are kind of uh, a representation of a Z2 gauge field because their, their values, the eigenvalues are plus or minus one, but they're a static Z2 gauge field uh, because they do not fluctuate. Whenever you are in a sector of a given uh, UIJ configuration, then you remain in that sector because the operator is conserved. And then there's a nice uh, a theorem by Lee uh, arguing, uh, uh, showing that, that that the ground state actually does not break translational symmetry. And you uh, can immediately then set all these U operators, sorry, all the eigenvalues of these U operators to uh, just say plus one uh, by gauge, uh, by gauge, uh, this, this uh, I mean, all, in the ground state, these U operators are up to gauge transformations, just uh, plus one. And that uh, is basically the, the exact solution of the Kitaev model in one slide, uh, where um, uh, you, uh, you, because now you have replaced uh, these U operators just by numbers, and then you have hopping fermions in, 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 um, uh, in, the, in the background of the static gauge uh, fields. And then you uh, compute the spectrum. Of course, it's a honey complexus. Then your spectrum of Majorana operators now is a kind of uh, kind of Dirac, Dirac fermion linear linear uh, linear um, kind of dispersion. Um, or, but you remember that this Majorana Majorana field, so it's only half the degrees of freedom. 
So now you have your uh, Z2 spin liquid ground states uh, because you have the fractionalized particles that are these Majorana fermions that characterize this ground state. You would now like to add other terms uh, in order to drive a quantum phase transition. So maybe the simplest thing that you could do is you add some Heisenberg interaction because you know when you add some hydro, strong Heisenberg interaction, you would add uh, you would go into some uh, antiferromagnetic uh, phase if say it's positive. Uh, and then you know there must be at least one transition, and you could hope that maybe this transition is is second order. And in fact, uh, of course, in in a real material where the Kitaev interaction is, uh, is 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 dominant or or maybe present. And then, of course, you will you will immediately have any other of such terms, including Heisenberg, for example. And of course, there have been lots of calculations on that, and and this is now the, the phase diagram, this kind of Kitaev Heisenberg model. And uh, here you see that indeed you have transitions, direct transitions between uh, this this liquid phase and, for example, the nil antiferromagnet. If you add uh, to uh, a positive J uh, to to a positive, however. This is a phase diagram that has been computed by ED. And the reason being that uh, there's actually no sign problem free quantum Monte Carlo available. There's a technical challenge because whenever you add such other term like this Heisenberg term or any other term that is compatible with the symmetry there, you always generate fluctuations of the gauge field. So then your nice property that your U operators commute with a Hamiltonian is no longer there. And that, uh, uh, that uh, prohibits any sign problem free quantum Monte Carlo. And uh, then uh, uh, you, you end up with uh, only simulations on very small lattices or kind of ED or DMRG. That's why um, here we cannot really proceed to look for uh, quantum critical points because we cannot really evaluate the nature of, of these transitions, just too difficult. So what else can we do? Well, we can generalize uh, these uh, Kita F model by replacing this poly matrices, two by two poly matrices, by uh, gamma matrices, uh, four by four matrices. So this is just a higher dimensional representation of the Clifford algebra. And indeed, if you actually go on with this uh, um, uh, dimension of the representation of the Clifford algebra, you can actually show that actually you can realize all 16 type of topological superconductors. Um, but here, let me just stick to this four, di four, four dimensional representation. Well, if you go with four-dimensional representation, of course, you can understand these gamma matrices as kind of uh, direct products of, of two poly matrices. And you can think of the first poly matrix as kind of being a spin matrix, and the second poly matrix, called tau, being kind of an orbital index, orbital matrix. And then you can write down some kind of Kitaev spin orbital model. So, uh, and, 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 and here, um, uh, you, you can, for example, uh, uh, assume some SU2 spin symmetry, uh, so uh, kind of kind of dot product uh, between neighboring sites of, of these uh, spins, but kind of Kitaev orbital sectors, kind of Kitaev, Kitaev. That's, that's kind of the model that you can just write down, if you like. And then actually what you can show is that by precisely the same prescription, um, introducing products of Majorana operators, you can also solve this model right on the ground state. So instead of, because now we have uh, four by four Majorana, uh, sorry, four by four gamma matrices, and there are five anti-commuting four by four matrices, um, you need six Majorana operators. And these six are called B1, B2, B3, and Cx, Cy, and Cz. If you plug these into the Hamiltonian, then you can show again, you can write this as some U operators, which are again just products of the Bs. Uh, they live, these U operators live on the links and C operators. The only difference now to uh, the original Kitaev model is that the C operators are actually three of those now. Now we have three flavors Cx, Cy, and Cz. Again, these U operators commute among themselves and uh, commute with the Hamiltonian, thereby uh, can be um, uh, simultaneously diagonalized with the Hamiltonian. Okay, now that's, that's a generalization of that. How does this generalization really help? And that's, uh, that's kind of uh, um, uh, these Kitaev-Heisenberg kind of spin orbital models. So why is this really, uh, why is this crucial? Well, the point is, now we have more degrees of freedom. You not only have the spin degrees of freedom, but also the orbital degrees of freedom, and that gives you more freedom 
to play with, you can add other terms and these other terms indeed still keep the gauge field static. And that's a crucial improvement to the original spin one half guitar Heisenberg models. And, 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 and let, me, let me show you one example for that. So that's kind of this Kitaev Heisenberg spin orbital model. So you have the, the Kitaev term, that, and that's the, the one term uh, we, we discussed before. And now uh, we just add usual standard kind of uh, um, uh, Heisenberg interaction in the uh, spin sector, parameterized by coupling J. Now what you can show is that with the parameterization I showed before in the previous slide, uh, this particular um, uh, um, uh, interaction is chosen in a way that, in fact, it involves only the C operators, itinerant Majoranas. And that immediately means that although this is, of course, an interacting term, this is an interaction that model is no longer solvable, but still it keeps the property that the gauge fields remain static. So this still means that these U operators commute with a Hamiltonian, commute among themselves, can be simultaneously diagonalized. It's still static. And if we do that, in fact, what we find is we get some four Majorana interaction term with some matrix in between. And that's, a, uh, uh, that's actually a, a three by three matrix because of three Majorana operators, three flavors. And you, you find this uh, to be some spin one matrix. It's kind of fundamental representation of SO3, uh, spin one matrices. So if you look at this Hamiltonian and in some mean field view, uh, what would be the phase diagram that you would expect then? Well, of course, uh, because uh, density of states of this Majorana operators is uh, um, zero uh, at, 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 uh, at zero energy, uh, you, it means that you would have a finite uh, kind of uh, liquid phase, spin orbital liquid phase at small j, and only a transition towards some other phase beyond a certain threshold, uh, beyond a certain finite j. And if you look at this term, then you would expect that actually uh, you would kind of kind, kind of a spin density wave kind of transition, where basically uh, this bilinear gets gets a vacuum expectation value. That's at least what you would expect in kind of mean field picture. So would you, you would expect that uh, you find um, uh, two different phases at least, and at least one transition in between uh, between this symmetric spin orbital liquid phase. And this phase, which breaks this SO3 symmetry, uh, which is kind of a, kind of the spin density wave. The point here, however, is that these are really spin one matrices, and spin one matrices have a zero eigenvalue. So I have eigenvalue plus or minus one and zero, right? And that means that the spectrum in this uh, in this uh, uh, SO3 broken phase is not fully gapped. But one out of three uh, cones remain uh, gapless. And that now is the question, can that really be seen in simulations? And, um, uh, and the first thing, of course, you can do is uh, uh, do some DMRG calculations uh, in the original model, in the, in, in the spin orbital model. And, and here uh, it's shown actually two things. Uh, the blue curve, that's uh, basically the uh, plaquette operator as a function of, 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 of this perturbation and this Heisenberg coupling. And the crucial point that you should see here is that uh, this plaquette operator always remains one, meaning this is really consistent with the argument that, that, that I gave you earlier that the, uh, the U operators, which uh, um, make this plaquette operator, so the plaquette operators uh, just the product of the U operators along a plaquette. And since the U operators remain static in the presence of finite J, also the plaquette operator remains static. It remains always at the plaquette operators uh, uh, W equals one. So this is really consistent with this transition being always at fine, uh, sorry, always at static, uh, st static uh, gauge field. However, the, um, the, the black curve shows the uh, magnetic order parameter and that is consistent with the transition towards some, uh, some, some magnetic phase. Uh, and it's also consistent with the single transition. So the picture that emerges here is, is uh, that you have a single transition and, and possibly continuous between the spin orbital liquid phase and the, uh, uh, the symmetry broken liquid phase, that still a deconfined phase, right? And in this, uh, in this deconfined phase, one of, uh, out of three Majorana cones remain gapless while two uh, acquire a gap. You can also write down some field theory describing this transition. 
and uh, you do some gradient expansion. And then, of course, in, in the field theory language, because of fermion doubling, you can always combine two Majorana fermions into, into, uh, in, into one uh, complex uh, um, Dirac fermion. And, and if you do that, you end up with three two-component Dirac fermions uh, with usual uh, Dirac kinetic term. And then you get from this four fermion, four uh, Mariana fermion interaction, you get a four Dirac fermion interaction with again involving the spin matrix, one matrix. So this is really like a standard um, uh, uh, kind of gross neveu um, uh, model with some peculiar uh, kind of four fermion interaction. And uh, now that we have this, this field theory, you can also ask for uh, what are uh, critical properties of this field theory. Does this field theory really feature a quantum critical point, at least in principle? And, and, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what, of course, you can do in, along the same ways as has been done uh, previously for all, the, all other types of cross neveu Yukawa type of field theories. So you do some hubbard stratonovitz transformation, you add uh, in, in, include some, uh, some um, order parameter field, uh, three component real field in this case, because it's an SO3 um, transition. And then, of course, by quantum fluctuations, you would also uh, include some um, uh, kinetic term for, for this uh, order parameter field. Then you can uh, try to compute a critical exponents by the standard methods. And, and we've done that in, in collaboration uh, with experts uh, um, who are, uh, oops, uh, um, for, for, um, for the, um, yeah, for various uh, high order uh, kind of uh, calculations. Uh, actually, this is three loop epsilon expansion around the upper critical dimension of four and uh, next to leading order one over n expansion um, and, uh, and, and even the fermion anomalous dimension at uh, uh, next to next to leading order and also some functional RG. And you can try to estimate uh, the, these exponents. So for n equals three, um, which, which is kind of three two-component uh, fermions, um, which is the um, uh, realization in the spin orbital kind of model, you will get a set of numbers. Doesn't really, uh, it's not really important what these numbers are. It's also not really important what the arrow bars are. Actually, we're not really sure about the arrow bars. But the crucial point is that these numbers are different from what would you would expect from the cross neveu heisenberg universality class. So gross neveu heisenberg would also be some uh, three component order parameter field, but because of the different you cover interaction, of course, you also get some different exponents. However, that's of course not the only difference, but the second difference is that in the microscopic realization, not in the field theory, but in microscopic realization, the particles are fractionalized. And that means it's really a fractionalized transition um, because the Majorana fermions are not present in, in a microscopic model. You have gauge uh, uh, redundancy. And what would that mean for the spectrum? And let me show this here for the case of the gross neveu Z2, um, because there, uh, previous, there has been previously uh, the spectrum be, been computed. And we similarly expect uh, uh, that, uh, for, like, sim expect a similar spectrum also for, for the gross neveu SO3, but that hasn't yet been computed. And again, the spectrum can be computed. And again, we expect that some of the states, for example, this fermionic state, this, this, this yellow one, that is not uh, gauge invariant and therefore does not occur in, in, in the fractionalized transition. However, other states will get some topological copies uh, uh, arising from this winding around, uh, around the torus. Okay, so um, before I move, move on, let me first ask, um, are there any questions and how much time do I have left? Uh, Time-wise, uh, you have, you know, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, uh, including questions or plus questions? Okay, let, 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 me, let me finish Let's in five 12 minutes, including questions. Actually, Very can good. I ask you a quick, yeah. quick question? There's a question, yeah. Maybe two minutes, like part of this 12 minutes. So, uh, yeah, just, um, when you map when you map your uh, spin matrices to Majorana fermions, so this is good at the algebraic level, but the level of representation is different, right? So it's not quite the same Hamiltonian. So is that it, just to understand? I mean, is this a source of the gauge invariant? Is that why you have to kind of uh, gauge out some degrees of freedom because you have a different, like, too bigger representation or something like that? And this is the source of. Okay, you know, wait a second. You're 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 talking about uh, this. Yeah, like, like this kind this of transformation, part? or even the previous one. Yes. I, yes. I, I suppose. I mean, I don't know the whole theory, but I suppose. I mean, this is good at algebraic level, but when you 
think about representations. It's it's not uh, it's not the same thing, right? And uh, uh -huh. field matrices, yes. is, you know, with four dimensional vectors, why the Majorana fermions? Yes. Well, it's it's a big yes. difference. Yes, very good, very good point. Yes, uh, that's that's precisely that's precisely this gauge uh, gauge constraint that I didn't really write down here. But the gauge constraint is that the product of all Majorana fermions need to be plus one. So uh, if at every site, so that's kind of this local constraint. And when you add this constraint, that uh, should should uh, uh, should uh, um, uh, then actually the number of degrees of freedom should be be the same as before. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and and so with this gauge constraint, you have you have the same have the same model uh, and okay, same so degrees. It, of freedom. Yeah. So this is unrelated to this this uh, gauge invariance that you are talking about here. I mean that. The, the 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 fact that these UIs are arbitrary is it's not related to that. And the fact that these UIJ commute with well, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's or it is. Yeah. So um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's not completely unrelated though, because of course the I mean it's a it's a gauge constraint and uh, it, it's 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 not the same. Let me say it like that, but it's also not unrelated because uh, because of course these UI operators they uh, these operators you are not gauge invariant themselves either. So uh, uh, basically, you introduce uh, this gauge redundancy uh, in order to satisfy the gauge constraint. Okay, so um, what what we're doing next is now we have this field theory. Uh, we also have the DMRG, uh, but uh, the most beautiful thing, of course, about this this microscopic model, this spin orbital model, now is that you can also do quantum Monte Carlo, uh, because because now it is possible to write down some sign problem free uh, sign pro problem free model uh, that um, that that can be simulated in quantum Monte Carlo, and um, the reason, of course, is that uh, with this uh, uh, decomposition, you basically effectively just have a uh, a gross Nouveau type of model, and that, of course, we all know can be simulated. So this is the model that we came up with. Uh, this is kind of uh, doubling, uh, or actually in some sense quadrupling the number of degrees of freedom, but that's, that doesn't really matter um, uh, too much. It's the same kind of gross Nouveau SO3 kind of transition that we'll, we're after. Um, the crucial point here is that, again, uh, we have this uh, spin one matrices occurring in this, um, in, in, in this four fermion interaction term. And that means that uh, increasing this interaction, we expect on the mean field picture uh, to, to this SO3 symmetry breaking. And that's also what we find, uh, uh, and, and, and that's, uh, that's uh, done by, by Si Hong, uh, the simulations. Um, and, and what is shown here is, uh, look at, at the triangles first, um, is the SO3 structure factor. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, uh, for the, for different system sizes, as a function of j, uh, this 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 coupling, and what you find is that beyond a certain threshold in this uh, in this phase here, so for, uh, somewhere here, uh, that this SO three structure factor, which can be understood as, as as kind of an order parameter for the uh, for the SO three order, that indeed increases with system size, uh, uh, it diverges with system size, and that means that really in this phase you have SO three order. So that is really between uh, uh, kind of uh, this weakly interacting phase and this uh, intermediately interacting phase, you really have this transition and you can study that. But then you find actually there's in this model actually also a second transition. And this second transition uh, that is characterized by some kind of interlayer, interlayer coherence. And in the mean field picture or in a mean field decoupling, you find that actually in a mean field way, this this inter, interlayer coherence phase, uh, where this order parameter, uh, which breaks some U1 uh, symmetry, um, that um, uh, uh, fully gaps the spectrum. So now you have a transition here, and, and that's kind of in the, in the next slide, uh, between uh, a symmetric semi-metal, semi -metal, which, which corresponds to this spin orbit liquid, and this SO3 ordered semi-metal, where uh, still one of the, out of three uh, cones uh, remain gapless. And then you have the second transition to this fully gap phase. And in order to show that uh, this is not only our, our interpretation of, of the order parameter, but this is also seen in actual data, let me show here the fermion spectral function for three representative values. 
uh, again, uh, this, this is consistent here with some DR cones. This is consistent with uh, some weight still present at the K point, but other weight is lifted. And uh, in this phase, you really have a gap, have a gap. And uh, not only uh, qualitatively, but also quantitatively, you'll find that the quasi-particle weight in this intermediate phase is one third of uh, the quasi-particle weight in the, in, the, in the weakly interacting phase. So what's the transition now? This first transition, the transition between uh, this, this symmetric phase and, 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 and uh, SO3 uh, uh, ordered phase. Well, you can look at correlation ratios as a function of J. And what you find is uh, that with, again, appropriate rescaling, uh, the, the, the reduced, uh, uh, well, correlation ratio as a function of, of the reduced uh, um, uh, coupling, um, you find indeed scaling collapse with some value of one over new. You also can uh, find a scaling collapse for the uh, order parameter. And again, you, you, you can try to extract some anomalous dimension and you can try to compare with the anomalous dimension you compute in field today. However, you can also look at the transition between uh, this SO3 semi-metal phase and the ordered phase. Uh, Lucas, question yes. about the previous slide. So how many, <laughs> how many direct fermions, two, uh, two component direct fermions do you have in this at low energy? Uh -huh. You, yes. At the bottom, you're comparing with n equals 12. Uh -huh. Now we're comparing with n equals 12 two component Dirac fermions. And the reason being that this is really quadrupled to, uh, to, to earlier because these simulations are not done with my. So in the, in the spin orbital, uh, microscopic spin orbital model, mm -hmm. you have Majorana fermions and the fractionalized particles are the Majorana fermions. But now uh, the simulations were done with Dirac's with complex fermions. That yeah. gives you one fact, factor of, of two. And then uh, another factor of two uh, is because of the doubling of the layers. Mm -hmm. So that gives you in total a factor of four. And earlier we already had had three uh, 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 three flavors of Majorana fermions. So this gives you three times four. Mm -hmm. So this is really kind of kind of a trouble quadrupled version of of the spin orbital model. It's not precisely the same universality class, of course I agree, but uh, it's a quadrupled version thereof. Yeah. At large n, because I mean n is large. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I guess you expect nu to be equal to one. Yes, that's true. Yes. Yes. So, so uh, I'm surprised that for twelve you get 0. 0.9, which I mean is not far from one, but it's it's not, not far from one. Yeah, but the, that's I guess that's the point that the corrections are actually quite large. The coefficients of in the one over n uh, in the one over n um, expansion are still quite large. So what, what we get for one over new is actually, uh, uh, so this is really, I mean, uh, uh, this is really this 0.93 is really the value that you get for n equals 12. So at least for this exponent is really consistent with, uh, with, uh, with the simulations, but that may be coincidence. I mean, so the, the quantum correction, the one over n correction is actually not so small and is giving agreement yeah. with the Monte Carlo. Yes, yes, for this exponent. For the other exponent, it's not as good, but uh, okay. yeah, it's actually quite bad, but <laughs> that's a different story. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, yeah, and then let me just uh, um, quickly flash you uh, the second transition. Uh, and, and that's maybe even more interesting because uh, now we have a transition uh, between uh, um, an SO3 semi-metal uh, so with SO3 order and a fully gapped phase, uh, which breaks a different symmetry, a U1 symmetry. But still, when we look at correlation ratios, uh, and also actually correlation length and other observables, we find that uh, these transitions appear to be consistent with continuous transitions. And now, if we uh, go uh, to uh, the critical values and try to extract this to the, uh, to the thermodynamic limit, we find that both the critical value at which this, uh, this SO3 order vanishes, as well as the critical value uh, at which this uh, um, uh, U1 order starts to occur, they converge to the same point. That may, appears to be kind of a unique uh, quantum critical point. And if that is really the case, then, uh, uh, then um, uh, well, if this, uh, if this uh, continues to hold in, 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 in the future, 
that would be really a realization of a new type of deconfined quantum critical point. In order to order transition between two different types of orders, however, in difference to previous quantum deconfined QCPs, this is really a deconfined QCP where a metallic degrees of freedom are still a play a role at, at low energy because this is really a semi-metallic phase. It's kind of a metallic deconfined quantum critical point. So let me now conclude. Um, I have really presented you uh, kind of two kinds of microscopic models. Um, well, everything's kind of motivated by this Kitaev type of spin orbital model that uh, have argued features a fractionalized version of a Fermi quantum critical point. And this fractionalized version is in the gross River SO3 star universality class. And I've introduced to this effective model, this bilayer model that in, indeed uh, features also uh, this transition, uh, this gross River SO3 transition, but also in a second transition uh, that uh, if it indeed is, is continuous as the uh, numeric suggests, uh, then um, it, it, uh, it uh, arguably realizes the first instance or microscopic instance of a metallic deconfined quantum critical point, uh, a deconfined quantum critical point in the presence of gapless fermion degrees of freedom. With this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And again, thank you for the, uh, for the nice workshop and the invitation. Looking forward to our questions. Thank you, Lucas. Now open to questions. Renbo, you have a question? Hi. So uh, did you mention, uh, is there any material that uh, we have is this Kitab uh, Heisenberg's spin orbital model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. There is not, not yet. Um, we actually do have some um, uh, ideas where in principle that could be realized. And, and we've passed on these ideas to, to colleagues here in Dresden, uh, which actually uh, uh, turned out to be actually uh, indeed interested to, to, um, uh, to, um, to uh, um, synthesize uh, these materials. But these are, I must admit, at least are really just guesses. Uh, where, in principle, of course, um, these these um, these uh, materials uh, could uh, uh, could um, uh, kind of uh, have such Kitaev type of spin orbital model. At least by symmetry, it is allowed. And in principle, because of strong spin orbit coupling, they, they can be there. But um, uh, yeah, it's it's really not clear whether one one would would be able to find something where this is really dominant. Because in order in order to have that, one would really need to have a dominant kind of Kitaev spin orbital model uh, interaction. There are several materials where, of course, as you know, I guess uh, several materials where we have that for the spin one half case, but for the spin orbit uh, like iridates and erythrium trichloride and cobalt cobaltates. But for, for the spin orbital realization, we're really at, at the beginning. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's really unrealistic to have these interactions, but in many cases, I guess you will have, um, uh, you will have other interactions that, that will be more dominant than this Kitaev type of interaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and I have a, a, another, uh, I think, simple and technical question. So could, could you go up to the Marana representation of yes. Been yes. Let me try to find it. Um, this one. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, I, I, did did you like uh, write write down all the representation or or these are just represented one and I just do cyclic mm -hmm. permutation. Uh -huh. Um. So um, uh, you mean uh, like um this one below here, right? Yeah, yeah. For for example, yeah. sigma z times sigma uh, times uh -huh. x. Yes, yes. Like, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of um, we we of course you can write down anything, anything, any kind of. Uh, I mean, if you look in you, as you know, if you look in in Wikipedia, there's different types of gamma gamma uh, representations, right? And uh, in principle, everything is equally well. Uh, equally well possible, but you would like to find the representation of your gamma matrices that um, leads to a simple Hamiltonian, because uh, um, I didn't write it down here. But uh, um, it, of course, you can you can write down your your Hamiltonian also in terms of some gamma terms. Uh, so, uh, in, instead of this uh, sigma cross tau, you can write it in terms of uh, gamma times gamma, gamma i times gamma j. And uh, you want to, uh, and that can be exactly solved in terms of these gammas. 
but then you want to write these gammas in terms of uh, in terms of sigma and tau, which is still looks simple. And in order because because everything that is simple that that kind of is natural to occur in, in a material, and that's why we looked at all possible representations um, that of course um, need to need to satisfy the Clifford algebra, and uh, we constructed this in a way just by trial and error. I mean there are not so many, but um, it's just trial and error uh, to construct it in a way. That uh, that you uh, you 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 get this simple and nice looking Hamiltonian. So it's really reverse engineering. In some sense, you can also um, you you can also use other uh, representations, and then you get some other Hamiltonian. And if it is still nice and beautiful, but some other other interaction, you can also solve it exactly. So there are many many possible many possible um, terms that can that can be solved exactly. But this one again has the feature. Uh, I think has the feature to being kind of kind of natural. Uh, and, and and so the the, the flux uh, you so uh, is that like uh, the same definition of a ski type? Yes, it's precisely the same. Yes, yeah. I I didn't get that, but yes, I think so. Yes, so uh, the the model is really. The model is really you can think of that once you, once you've done this uh, this representation in terms of Majoranas, um, then uh, really what you have is three layers, if you like, or three copies of Majorana fermions. However, that couple coupled to the same Z two gauge field, and that is really crucial to get this other um, other types of topological superconductors um, because otherwise it would be just it's not it's not it's not just three instances of kita f uh, n equals one but it's actually n equals three so um I, I guess maybe that was your your question right uh so it's it's really n equals three uh um you have you have three uh, three copies of majorana firmus but they couple to the same z2 gauge field and therefore your churn number is n equals three if you uh, would would uh, um uh, gap these out uh, via some time reversal symmetry breaking term. Was that the question? Uh, my question was, just, what, what's the ground state? <laughs> yeah, the ground state is a Z two spin liquid with n equals three. Uh, it's uh, it's it also has it also has linear dispersion, uh, Majorana dispersion. It's the same dispersion but just three copies thereof, and then coupled to uh, to a gap device on. Okay. Yeah, but I think uh, yeah. All the UI J's commute with H. So I think you can put them all to one up to gauge yes. transformation. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was, so, I see, I see. Okay, yes, that's true. U equals one. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, now I got the question. <laughs> yes, you're completely right. There's no translation of symmetry breaking. U equals one. There's also actually, there's actually also a, a, a leap theorem for, for this, uh, for this, um, uh, well, um, I, actually, that I'm not sure about, but the result is u equals one, even in the presence of finite j. But for 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 a zero j, there is definitely u equals one by Leap theorem. Yes, yes. I have a question, Lucas. Well, thanks for the nice talk first, and it's very interesting. Um, so regarding the last point, you talked about this transition mm -hmm. between the SO3 metal, semi-metal, I'm sorry, and the gap phase. Yes. So yes. naively, it seems a uh, conventional transition where you have, because in the Monte Carlo, now you have regular fermions. Uh, it's a gross neveu transition, right? Uh, no stars yes, anymore. The, that's true. Uh, yes, in, in the... In the to get the yeah. star uh, spectrum, you just project out some operators, and but the other exponents yes. of gauge invariant operators agree between gross neveu and gross of a star, I mean, with the appropriate uh, symmetry breaking term. Um, yes. So, I'm a bit, so for this, yes. Uh, what's the, because it's, uh, you're breaking some U1, right? Because you broke yes. SO3 to U1 in the red phase, and from red to yellow, there's the U1 that oh. goes away. But the, 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 the Dirac fermions that were gapped in the red phase, you know, you can take the gap to infinity, essentially, right? Near the critical point between red and yellow. Yes. And yes, just work so. with the massless yes. formula. So wouldn't yes. that be like a XY transition um, for fermions, yeah. Grossner XY or O2? 
Yeah, so uh, yes, I mean, um, but then you have a fine tuning problem. Uh, in principle, yes, with fine tuning, um, because um, you can, of course, gap out, uh, get, gap out the, um, you, you can gap out the remaining fermion, the red fermion, uh, add some arbitrary value of J. But then there is no reason why precisely at this value of J, there, uh, the SO3 order breaks down. Um, the point here is that the SO3 order breaks down at precisely, apparently, at least for this, uh, for this, uh, in, 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 I mean, up to our numerical accuracy. Um, the SO3 order breaks down at the same value of J where the U1 order, and I think that's, that's really unusual if you, if you would write, like to write down some field theory for that then uh, there's no reason why this one order should break down at the same order where the second order, because these are really orders that are completely unrelated, kind of different types of orders. Uh, and it's, there's no reason why the one order should, should, uh, should uh, break down when the other order step uh, kind of gets generated. Okay, so that's where I'm confused, I guess, when you write down J SO3 equal to J U1, because in the red phase, the SO3 semi-metal, the SO3 is broken, right? I mean, the, the yes. five vector shows some direction. Yes. Um, and then you have U1, you can rotate about that direction. So the SO3 is, is broken in the red. Yeah, but it's a different U1. So of course there is also one, uh, there is one U1 that is kind of the direction perpendicular to, uh, to the SO3 yes. uh, 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 or to this order. Uh, but that's not the one that uh, that is uh, that is broken in the in the um, in the um, in the in the yellow, yellow phase. So okay, so um, which which one? Maybe yeah. So that's what. Uh, uh, so it's an interlayer. It's an interlayer U one. Um, so that was kind of I guess quite fast. In terms um, of but, bilinears in the in the field so, theory. Yes. yes. So is, okay. It's kind of mm -hmm. this. This is kind of the bilinear in the microscopic model. Mm -hmm. And the crucial point is that is a one and a two, so this is really that that couples two different types of uh, uh, two different types of um, of spinners. Yeah, so it's like psi one, yeah. psi two. Yes, and and one and two is the layer index. Yes, yes. So these are really uh, these these couples uh, um, uh, uh, fermions from the from the different layers, mm -hmm. and and that uh, while while this this SO three symmetry is really a symmetry that acts on this on this flavor index within a layer. So yeah. within each layer, you have kind of an SO3 symmetry. So in that sense, it's really different, different symmetries. Okay, so at this second critical point, G over T equal to one here. Yes, so this is really the, at, at this critical point is really the transition where, where this, uh, this uh, magnetic, if you like, magnetic order breaks down and, and, and this interlayer order uh, steps in. And these are, these are really different symmetries. Uh, and, and for example, if you do mean field theory for, for that lattice mean field theory, you actually get a strong first order transition. So that's something that you would think is kind of consistent with, of course, as it, as it must be, with, with uh, Landau Ginsburg Wilson picture. But uh, in, in a simulation, uh, it's actually the correlation length is, is very large and exceeds, exceeds the lattice, finite lattice sizes. And is there a reason, like, if you do this crossing analysis, you mm -hmm. find that the critical point is at one, or this transition is near one? I mean, it's kind of J over T. Yeah, yeah, Microsoft yeah that's, that's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, well, what's the estimate? On it's the, actually uh, extremely J close. Yeah. So uh, let let me see. Do I have it here? It's yeah, it's yeah. extremely close to one. Um, so where is it? Uh, no, that's the wrong slide. JC two. So here. You see, uh, so this this is really, I mean, this is. Oh, sorry. Do you see my mouse? Yeah. You see it, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is it is it is consistent within accuracy with being one, but is this a coincidence I, uh, or not? I I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. We haven't really thought about that. I mean, if it were that that would mean that there is some um, some uh, maybe some Higher duality symmetry. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. there some higher, some higher symmetry, symmetry yeah. when they're equal? Yeah, it's a good. That's a good question. It's actually a very good question. <laughs> Maybe we should think about that. I mean, if if it it could be just a coincidence, right? But if it if 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 there's really some higher symmetry or some some uh, some uh, some duality, uh, like like um, uh, 
Kramer's one year, one year duality, uh, uh, then, uh, then maybe there's a reason why it must be at one. I don't know. Good point. Because some Hamiltonians, when you set couplings equal to the same value, have enlarged global symmetry, and this leads That's to true. some consequences. I'm not saying it's happening here, but I'm just, uh, it's just curious. That's true. Just... Yes, that's true. Uh, that, that's actually, an, yeah, it's an interesting observation. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, are there any other? OK, there's another question. Uh, please, Renbo. So I have a follow-up question. So did, have you done the? Uh, spin correlation functions in this uh so so it's just the same as kitab model my question is that uh so so in kitab model spin correlation function can be i think exactly so so uh -huh. yeah i, I see i see uh, yeah. i see uh, yes yes uh, mm -hmm. in this spin orbital model it's the same yes i think it's the same it's just it's just the same because you yes diagonal. So it's, it's this ultra local correlation function, right? So of course that is, does not hold for this effective model, not for this bilinear model. Of course, there is is completely different. Um, but um, for for the original uh, microscopic uh, spin orbital model, uh, there the correlation function also has this ultra local property that you only have um, a correlation between nearest neighbor sites, and otherwise it's zero. And and also that of course also only holds for j equals zero. Right. I mean, once you once you add some Heisenberg term, then also uh, you spoil this property. But for J equals zero, I think it's true. Yes, yes. Same correlation function. If there are no other questions, uh, let's thank Lucas again. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Yeah.